Welcome, everybody, to a special edition of the Indie Reads Aloud radio program. We are starting a new feature this month, which is the Indie Reads Aloud book club. Uh, this is where at the beginning of the book, at the beginning of the month, we uh, tell you about a book that you should read. And then at the end of the month, we all get together in the Zoom room and we um, assail the author with questions and poke at him about various things that he's written about and ask him in-depth questions about his writing process, which he may not be able to answer. So here we are today. Christopher Gare is joining us for our very first book club episode with his book, Butterflies I Have Known. Welcome, Christopher. I'm so glad you agreed to be in the hot seat first time out. You threatened me if I didn't. I did threaten you, but, you know, you can be bribed, so it works. You said you know where I live. It scared me. <laughs> and as well it should. <laughs> um, so, Butterflies I Have Known is just an amazing book. I was so honored that I got to read it early. Um, this is such a great story. I just, I just love, love, love this story. I love what you do with it. I love what you don't do with it, so you can let your readers do things with it. It's it's just a really, really cool book. So as we begin starting, and I can see the little wheels in your head already turning, but as as, as we begin, before we get started with questions, um, can you please give us a real quick synopsis for those who may have not read the book yet? And I've already warned people that there might be spoilers if they haven't read the book. So if you can tell us um, what the book is about, and then we'll get into q and I couldn't even do a quick synopsis when I wrote the back cover. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a slightly complicated book. I mean, in a, in a nutshell, uh, you've got a World War II photographer who's still alive in his 90s, who is uh, traveling throughout the U.S. with... Um, uh, displays for museums and he is actually looking for two people who um he had known back during world war ii uh american soldier and an asian american soldier who had fought together and who had died in the battlefield and he had always suspected that they had a kinship and they were in love without being able to say they were in love because of the times and they were both killed in the battlefield and he is convinced at some point that they would be able to come back and pick up in their relationship where they left off and actually be together in current times. And he meets two people in Detroit who he begins to suspect might be these two people. Okay. You're okay. right. That's, 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 that's a synopsis, but oh, there's, so much, there's so much more to this story. It really is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there, there are these great, wonderful overtones of, of uh, reincarnation philosophy but at the same time there are also these wonderful connections of humor and um uh sarcasm which i just love i love your sarcastic wit when you write i've seen this in in a couple of your pieces um a lot in your comedy work but also in the falling awake series i saw some of this um just at the right time I think you know when we need comedic levity. One character in in the, the Falling Awake series was not the comedic character per se, but he was, you need to have balance. You had all this seriousness and all this darkness in it. You had to have something yeah. to balance it out. And his character was the one that provided just that little nudge that had to happen. Well, and I think, too, in this book, um, I I think having that balance is really important because otherwise it could have been an over-the-top sappy love story. Yeah. And, and so I think you balanced really well the heavy emotion with the satirical nonsense. And I, I just think that was, it was just brilliant the way you mixed the two elements. It's just... I thought it was great. Ralph, I won't let that comment go to my head. <laughs> um, no, I, I think what did it for me, though, as far as when you're talking about balance, is yeah. the Caucasian character is who you would expect the Asian character to act like. And the Asian character is acting much more like the Caucasian character should be acting like. 
Right. And that's what made it interesting for me to play with because swapping them like that, that made it completely worthwhile for me. Yeah, it, it allows you to see the story through a completely different lens because it forces the reader to jump in and out of the character's skins in a way that normally they wouldn't have to do. And I, I just, I just think stereotypes. The story, yeah, and I think the story, the story is richer for it. Um, Marianne, Ralph, or Catherine, do you guys have any questions or comments for Christopher at this point? What was your inspiration for the story? I needed to lighten the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. I had done four of the Falling Awake books, which were the darkest things I'd ever written. It was written during a time in my life I hope never to ever relive. Um, I had my father pass away. I ended up having a very good friend of Ralph's and mine pass away. Uh, my grandmother passed away. My mother passed away. I had all of this grief just adding up and nowhere for it to go. And I finally started channeling it through the Falling Awake books. So it's incredibly dark. And then Author friends had been telling me for years that I was a romance author in disguise, which I still to this day disagree with. And I wrote Beautiful Moment. And I took the most damaged character I could possibly come up with, giving him his own journey and a much better ending than he had where he started. So coming off of that book, I needed to lighten up. And I kept thinking, I, I didn't want to go and write a comedy again, like the Galeas book, which was, it's like one one-liner after the other. Comedies tend to age a little badly these days. What's funny now isn't going to be funny in a year or two years or three years. But I thought, if I could come up with a story, and again, I do usually have a balance of a Caucasian character and an Asian character only because of my relationship with Ralph being in one of us being Asian, one of us being Caucasian, you don't see a lot of books out there with these types of characters. So I thought, true, let's, let's have some fun with it. Let's let's take these two characters. I knew when I started the book, I had the first chapter written, and then I went, as I usually do, and I wrote the very last chapter. So I knew exactly how it was going to end. And then I started playing with the story in between. I really kind of toiled with whether or not I was going to give readers an answer at the end of the book. Were they reincarnated? Were they not reincarnated? If I did my job by the end of the book, it really shouldn't matter because you're kind of rooting for them anyway. Right. So does it really need to be said? But then I had also written the poem that appears at the end of the book. And then the poem, once you get to the poem, you realize exactly what that answer is going to be. Yeah, and I... One of the things I loved best about the way you ended this book, and of course, for those of you who hadn't read it, spoilers, I love that you gave the fathers a wonderful payoff for them. That was a cheat. I was re I was really, really, really cheering for the dads throughout the whole book. Like, please, let's let's connect. Just just make this connection with your children, please. And I was really happy that you gave them that. How did you see that as a cheat? Because I thought it was brilliant. The end part with um, Matthew's father, who uh, who finds the poem on the back of the photo. To me, I kept thinking, how in the world am I going to have them read this? What are the reactions going to be? What could the reactions be? <laughs> like, maybe it's just better not to know what their reactions are. But how do you still introduce this? And I thought, let's bring the father into it. The father, who's already been supportive of his son, has met Gian, likes him. Let's let the father find it, and let's let let's have our moment of subtlety with the father, and everything dawns on the father, and you see it through his eyes. Mm. And the two so the two boys walk out at the end, and he sees them, and he sees them as you know my son and my son's partner, but also these two people who were alive way back, who died then to be with each other now. And he you get to see it through his eyes instead of theirs. To me, it felt a little like a cheat because I don't give you that payoff of them finding out. See, that's interesting to me because I thought it was a sincere payoff. I just felt like the end was perfectly natural in the way it should have happened. 
I didn't feel like it was contrived at all. What did you and guys think? Anybody else have comments about the ending? Yeah, I didn't feel it was a cheat either. At all. I think it was perfect. Yeah. I did my job well. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a nice warm fuzzy at the end of it. I just went, oh, it's, it's it it almost, I mean, I hate to say that this way. It almost felt like a Hallmark ending. Like That's okay. That is okay. All, I was I'm happy the, with that. Everything was... I felt like everything was resolved and I felt like everything was done and that I I felt like there weren't any leftovers that, that I felt um, robbed of, you know, it, it, it just felt done. I had fun writing the um, Gian's parents mm -hmm. because again, there's the stereotypes of the Chinese mother. She was not the stereotypical tiger mom. She was right. very balanced and the husband was a little overbearing, but I had so much fun uh, with the end of that story when they're finally in bed that night and uh, the father says, oh, I have been forgiven because he tells the Google hub, play this song. And it says, uh, right. sure, lion of the family playing this. Yeah, because he's, 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 he's happy and he's content. And yeah, Alexa. Alexa redeemed him. <laughs> well, then the mother looks at it. She says, no, play this instead. And says, sure, Lion Tamer. And I love how the father looks and says, you had to tell him. <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah. That, that too was fun. And that, that actually was, I, I borrowed that there. Um, I want to say a year and a half ago, I was at work and it was very early in the morning. And we had an elderly, I think we were, Chinese or Japanese couple came in. I'm going to say elderly, like in their early 80s. They came into work and they'd come up to me to ask for directions because he didn't like to ask for directions and they were lost. So after I got them the, the directions, she looks at me. She says, do you know what he told me when we got married? And I said, no. She says, she told me he was the lion of the family. And I laughed. I said, really? She says, do you know what I told him? I said, no. She <laughs> says, I am the lion tamer. <laughs> like I have got to use that in something. I have to. They were so sweet. I love that conversation with them. Went and wrote it down, sent it to myself in an email. I'm like, I got to use this in something. It's too yeah. good. And that that kind of answers um, Diana Duell's question. She asked how much of the banter between the characters was based on real conversations you've had. Here's, I want to do an extension of that question, which is how much of the banter in charlie wants to come up and sit how long how much of the banter between um the two main characters came from your relationship with ralph that's what i want to know not not so much the banter in this one i would say if anything timing when i sit down and i'm sketching out a scene in my head the book is almost written like a screenplay all dialogue comes first okay I figure I can always go back and add everything around it. But to me, I want the beats. I want mm -hmm. the voice. And if I can sit there and I could just nail out dialogue left and right and go back and start revising it, those voices have to feel very real to me. If they don't, then I don't have the character. So if I can get the characters down and I can see how they're interacting with, I know their personalities already, but you know, one says this, someone's going to respond to this, and I finally get that rhythm down then I can go back through. And it's, Ralph and I have a, a thing with our timing. We we can, we have a really good fix on how we're going to respond to something. And I don't know frequently how he's going to respond to me, but I know it's going to be fun. And it's going to be sarcastic. <laughs> so, I mean, I know that and we, we've got the timing down. So I can take that timing and put it with the characters and say, I know this works for me in real life. Let's have it work for the characters. Gene and Matthew were fun to write, but mm -hmm. Matthew's so uptight. And <laughs> I'm not uptight. Ralph is not uptight. Gene yeah. is very playful. Ralph is not as playful as Gene by a long shot. And I'm not nearly as playful as Gene either. But they had to play off each other. Sure. So sure. One, one had to be much more polar opposite than the other. 
Yeah. Um, Ralph, would, would you agree with Christopher's assessment of these characters and how they compare with you? Probably. I don't usually let them get away with much. In fact, I thought the Alexa thing came off the thing for, from us, Chris, where I told him to start using the technology around the house. So some odd reason he decided to reprogram or, or create a profile for Alexa. So whenever I said anything downstairs, I said, hi, Christopher, here's your news. I'm like, what the? And I couldn't change it from Christopher to Ralph for the next year and a half. So I <laughs> He, he even, told me to do it. He, he he said do it, and I never listened. So I finally said, "I'm just going to do it." And he was upstairs. He, he says, "This thing downstairs. thinks I'm you." <laughs> upstairs, I'm like, "That's odd." It keeps calling me Christopher. No matter what I could do, I could not erase his voice profile from it. <laughs> and aren't you aren't you supposed to be the technology wizard? You'd think you would actually think on certain days, but yeah. yeah. Hi, Donna. Welcome. We're just sitting here having a good time. Turn on your mic if you like. Yeah. Sorry, it has been the day, and I'm like, I have to look in, and I've been looking for the link and got sidetracked. It's been. <laughs> That's it. okay. You're... Diana said you had a ton of questions, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, if you have I any questions. I'll say I had a ton of questions. <laughs> He's being difficult. He's being Christopher. Um, okay, while we let Donna catch her breath, um, Diana Durrell had another question. I like, she says, I like the plot idea of the reincarnation of the World War II men, but then to add the switching of the and, and ethnicities was a twist. And she asked where you came up with that idea. We kind of touched on that a little bit, but what was the thing that made you say, okay, I'm going to flip them rather than having them being reincarnated as themselves? What made you decide to do the mirror imaging? It was a very simple reason behind it. It was the only way to keep me from being bored with it. Okay. If you've got valid. two people, one looks white, one looks Asian, and you think, oh, I know how this one's going to act. I know how this one's going to act. That to me is very boring. Mm. So why not swap it? And I had the perfect opportunity to do that if they were going to be reincarnated. And I gave some rather flimsy reasoning behind it in the story where I'm like, well, and they came back and they didn't know they were going to meet each other. They would always be reminded of the other when they looked in the mirror. Really doesn't hold up, but it sounds pretty good. Yeah, it, it was. I thought it was a fun plot device. I, I thought it worked. And right down Matthews. to the, the mirror image of the scar, right? Yes, where, yeah, we're... Gian's got the four wounds on his yeah. chest and Matthew has the scar. The scar on the back, that was mine. <laughs> that I borrowed from me from when I sliced my back open because I thought, oh. oh, I can use this. Well, sure. Why not? That works. Yeah. So, yeah, that was <laughs> painful. <laughs> Marianne, Catherine, Donna, Ralph, do you guys have any other questions for Christopher? Any other comments about the book? Not a comment about the book. I have a comment about just from other points of views. Has there been a lot of um, like somebody who read the book? Have you had any like those really weird comments? Like you're like, you know, I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for. But, you know, somebody who's like, oh, you know, I read your book, but I thought this would have been there. Like, was there any been like strange moments like you're like, I never thought of it about that that way, or I um, just strange conversation that you've ever had with a reader about the book. I guess is the question I'm asking. There were two. There were two. Um, I I don't mind. I, I actually enjoy reading the reviews, even the ones that aren't always particularly positive, because I'm thinking I do the same thing. I don't. If I read a book, I may not like it. I watch a movie. There are times I really just don't like it, and I'm not afraid of expressing myself. I can't expect somebody not to do that with me. One of the comments that I remember reading in one of the reviews, because I kind of like went, huh. They felt that the characters, I think they're 31 years old in the story. They felt that the characters did not talk like 31-year-old characters. They talked much, much younger. And it was the only person I've run into who made that comment. And I thought, huh, okay. That was that was different. I, that's not something that came across, and my editors didn't suggest that or mention that. No one else has mentioned that. But again, 
reading something, it's it's completely reader response. If that's how they felt, that's exactly how they felt. Can't really do anything yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, right. I mean, you can't. You you have to validate their opinion about it. I didn't see that. My son is thirty three, and I thought all the dialogue was right on par. So, I don't know. That that's interesting though that you would get that kind of a comment. Did you get any other odd off the wall responses like that? There was, um, and I'll blame her for this too. I was having a conversation with another author, Kathy Brockman. Pretty sure that's her name. Uh, and she had asked me, we were, we were chit-chatting about it. She gave me a really nice review. And she said, well, you know, when's the second book coming out? I'm like, there isn't one. There, There's no second book. The, the characters are done. It's, I can't see going beyond this because to me it would spoil the whole thing. Okay. She says, well, what about, you know, the character Christian? I'm like, what about him? He, he's in maybe four pages total throughout, just in the very beginning and like a couple of places at the end and at the very end, there's a very, very minor character. She said, well, you know, I'm very curious about his story. Why? There is no story. Because so, he's yeah. mildly mysterious. He's mildly m mysterious. I get where somebody would be looking for his backstory. And if I did that, it was completely unintentional and completely by mistake. So I, I'm, Mulling this comment over, we signed off, and I was driving out to Meyer, and I'm mulling the thing over because it's just stuck in my head. And I'm like, he doesn't have a story. He just, he, I needed him to do this, 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 and this, and he did it. And he's out. He's gone. He's done. I pulled into Meyer's parking lot, put my head on the steering wheel, and went, he has a story. He does have a story. So this probably segues a little bit into the one I'm working on now. Okay, so give us that segue while I convince Charlie that he doesn't need to bark at everything that moves. I was wondering what was going on. <laughs> Apartment life is fun with a small dog. So, yes, it's Kathy Brockman's fault that I was in the middle of, I had 40,000 words written on my first young adult novel, which I really, really had wanted to get out in December, and I could have, except after she put it in my head that Christine had a story, and I tried to put it in her head, no, he didn't. And then 15 minutes later, realized he did, went back home, and I'm very, very close. I'm finishing up the last chapter, uh, the first uh, first draft of basically a companion story to Butterflies. It's not a sequel. It does take place right after a part of Butterflies ends, but the focus is now on Christian. Who and I it, did not it, realize. So it's, it's not a sequel and it's not a prequel. It's just a sidebar kind of thing, right? Yeah. It's like if this is the uh, butterflies and the story goes from A to the end, this would be about here. And it just kind of veers off this way. So you're following this character now, which I okay. thought, I'm like, I'll try it. I'll see if there's a story there. And there was. And it so Christian really... Yeah, Christian really wanted his story told. I don't know if he did or not, but Kathy Bachman did. <laughs> Perfect. But Any that, other... that's the one. Sorry. It, so do we have a working title for that? I do. Uh, there was an original working title, which I was never happy with. But the one that's come out of it right now is called Snow Angels in the Dust. That's very exciting. Because I'm looking forward to seeing what she comes up with for a cover for this one, just based on the title alone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your cover designer is brilliant. She's really good. She was a she's, wonderful find. Yeah, she's amazing. The The covers for your books, the, and they always fit the stories really, really well. So the two of you have something kindred going on because that connection is not always an easy one to find. I promised her too when I when I found her and I we were chit chatting back and forth. I said I promise I am not going to micromanage you. I'm going to tell you what I'm looking for. I'm going to tell you what the story is about. What I'll I'll feed you anything you need to know, but I won't micromanage. And she always yeah. comes back with something that just nails it. Yeah, yeah, that's very very cool. Um, any other questions, Marianne, Catherine, Donna, Ralph? Any questions? Comments? Well, Marianne, you are so quiet tonight. Whoops, sorry, Ralph. So I question you enough as a daily occurrence as it is. Daily, <laughs> hourly, hourly. <laughs> Marianne, you are awfully quiet tonight. 
I'm kind of floating. I overdid it yesterday, so this is pain medicine. Yeah. And the question I'm coming up with has literally nothing to do with the book. It just <laughs> Oh, well, please ask it. Please ask it. Yeah. What's your question? It was kind I'm of now dying to know what it is. It was earlier. It was like Ralph is Asian. <laughs> yes, he is. Oh. Yeah, she's on pain meds, guys. She had surgery not long ago. So that trick is floating in my head. I didn't know he was Asian. <laughs> you want to address this one, Ralph? Sure. What the Wilcox doesn't actually give it away as an Asian name. Uh, it's funny. Growing up as a kid, I got used to being Chinese when I was a kid when people saw my mom. And now, as an adult, being in Hong Kong, everyone looks at me and says, "You're Chinese? We don't. We don't see it." They, so. Chinese people think I'm white. When I was younger, white people thought I was Asian. So it, uh, it's uh, for being half half. I, I think I got more of the, well, some more of the, the Asian genes and stuff like that. But so, so so based on where you are, they identify you as the other parent's child, right? right well, I, I, I used to feel <laughs> sorry for my poor father as you know white guy walking around with two asian kids especially after we've been in hong kong and you know the summer and we were all dark and looked nothing like this poor white guy probably <laughs> glad human trafficking children wasn't a thing back then because probably somebody would have called them uh, and we're dead but uh <laughs> no over here it's interesting so like if i hang out with chinese friends and i have an american cantonese accent so whenever i pronounce something i still can't hear the tones even growing up with it i've never been able to hear the tones and there's seven different tones in Cantonese. So you've got to get the, uh, so, so like if you say tong, 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 it, it can mean sugar, uh, ironing, soup. It just depends on how you raise or lower it. So I do everything by context, which leads my Cantonese friends to tease me relentlessly on, on some stuff if I get it wrong. So uh, even after all this many years, and I've forgotten a lot of stuff. And a woman called up yesterday and said something about my internet bill. and. I got hung up on the word internet. I'm like, exactly what are you talking about again? I'm like, oh God, okay, got it. I must be getting old. The 49 thing must be actually taking effect. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, I get that a lot. So uh, over here, I, I definitely get uh, uh, more white syndrome than, than anything else for lack of a better term. In fact, when we used to go shopping here with my mom, she used to make us like out in the, the street vendors, you know, like we have, there's, supermarkets and markets but then there's the open markets where you go and you're uh, buying fruits and vegetables and things from from vendors sort of like a, a farmer's market my mom used to have us wait by the corner because having two white kids with you meant you know the prices got raised so she used to stand us there and say wait for me here so they don't overcharge me as she, <laughs> as she would go shopping wow I love cultural differences. I think that's an amazing thing that things are so different. I also think it's it's comforting to me because I've known Christopher for so long and he was my first indie author crush. Did he tell you that? I don't know if he told you that. It, he was the first author that I went, oh my God, this is reality. You can actually be somebody in this industry. And uh, and so, yeah, I, I believe that Christopher walks on water for a long time. So it's nice for me to hear that occasionally you get teased because I often hear from Christopher that he's getting teased. So it it's comforting for me as a super fan to go, oh, well, there is balance in that. He doesn't always get picked on. <laughs> no, actually, he appreciates you very much. We, we've talked about you. All good things numerous months of times and usually the person and usually when he's getting teased it's usually me doing it so <laughs> <laughs> actually there was there was uh, you'll remember this Ralph but I mean he worked out in Arizona for quite a bit and there were times I'd get a phone call from him and he's like you aren't going to believe this I'm like what and he's like I'm getting gas it happened again people walk up to him and they just start speaking Spanish which used to irritate the living daylights out of him so he turned around speak Cantonese to him Chinese. <laughs> no, no, I would not speak Cantonese to the right. If, invariably, if I was in a Walmart or sorry, a, a Walgreens or a CVS or something like that, I would get somebody Spanish coming up to me. 
and I, I had two years of high school Spanish and I still can barely remember how to tell, tell you how, what's the time in, in Spanish. So I was very polite, like, oh, no habla. <laughs> and very try and help them out because they were usually it was older people that were trying to, to get something in red or something like that. And I, yeah, I, so I've gotten everything from, going back to that, I've gotten everything from Asian, Italian to Spanish or, or, or Mexican. So. But along that note, too, yesterday, it was his birthday yesterday. And when I was at work, I got him on video chat and I was going into my coworkers offices and I was saying, you know, hey, happy birthday. One of my other coworkers, she had she brought her phone out and she was looking at her backyard at all the snow and she was showing me. And I, I turned the phone around to show Ralph the, her phone with all the snow. And as I'm doing this, my other coworker has just texted the other two coworkers and it pops up. Her text pops up on the phone says, is that Ralph? <laughs> yes, that's Ralph. He doesn't look Asian. Oh, here we go. <laughs> what fun. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's circle back to the book for a minute. <laughs> I mean, Ralph, I could sit and talk to you forever because there are a million questions I have about Christian Christopher that I want to know that he'll never tell me, but you probably would. But we can't oh, in a heartbeat. That. But we can't do that in this forum. So maybe when you come to the States, you and I can go have lunch or something. That Sounds would be fun. That would be we'll fun. bring Marianne with her and she'll be medicated. <laughs> I want to know what Marianne is on. <laughs> Does Marianne know? <laughs> so, Christopher, what kind of research did you have to do for this book? Did you have to do the any least, research for it? The least amount possible. I hate research so much. I truly do. With this one, what I ended up having to go into was to find out, were there really Asian American troops fighting alongside Caucasian troops during World War II in the U.S.? Sure. The uh, given, given the history of the Jim Crow laws, we can understand that might be a question, right? So I found out there were. I found out where they trained together, and I found out one of the battles, which I used, and I thought, this is great. That's That was about as much research as I did for it, just so I could give it some authenticity, and the fact that a World War II photographer could still be alive today. He'd be in his 90s, but he would still be alive. So that yeah. could, you know, uh, there was also something I'd found, too, where they said, Sometimes from one life, if you if you believe in reincarnation, from going from one life to the next, sometimes you bring marks back with you on your body from the previous life. And I thought, well, I can bring that into the mix too with them. And that just kind of strengthens it. So that's that was the extent of the research I did. That's very cool. Anybody else have questions? Catherine, Marianne, Donna, Ralph? Okay. Um, Diana had another one. How much of your own personality is written into your characters? And she wanted to know this, not just about this book, but about across your whole body of work. How much of you seeps into the stories? A little bit of me, I think, in every book. You have to. I, I have to, because that's how I understand the story from the inside looking out, not the outside looking in. I need to be involved in it. So in order to get involved in it, I will put a bit of myself in there in some fashion. Uh, with a uh, beautiful moment. That main character is dealing with all of his relatives who have passed, which mirrored me. They didn't die the same way, but mm -hmm. they all did pass. So I put myself in the middle of that grief and said, I can write about that. So yeah. I did that. So uh, what, did you find that that kind of a process is cathartic for you or is it um, frustrating? I mean, I know it has to come out somewhere, but do you find it helpful for it to come out when you have to process through emotions on the page? Or do you feel like, oh, I, I've already processed this. Why am I doing this on the page? Is, no, is there that the, struggle back and forth? The fact that I hadn't finished processing yet is what helps me get it out on the page. Once I have it out on the page, I know it's a, it's a physical form. I can go and I can touch it. I can touch that book. I flip through the pages and I can see all of my emotions in there. And I think, okay, I've gotten it out. This is good. I've done something positive with it. It's not just negative. I've done something and I've given the character a journey. I've given him a happier ending. Um, he's got some closure to it. And I gave him some really good closure in the beautiful moment. And the title of it suggests one thing. The cover of it suggests something really, really nice. You get into it and you're like, oh my God, there's so much angst. 
Yeah. But yeah, you get to I, the end of it and you're like, okay. I've started to read it two or three times and then something happens in my real life where I go, no, I can't process both at the same time. <laughs> I have to do one at a time. In Butterflies, I think what I tried to do was take a character like Matthew, who I know people like him who are very stoic. And with Gian, I put not an idealized version of myself, but a slightly more extreme version of myself and wanting to play tricks on people and wanting to have a sense of humor about people. And, and I put that in him and imbued him with it. And that was fun for me to just also put that out there and see how the characters around him did react. So in, in any of that creation of him, did you find yourself, um, invoking things that you would have liked to have done or said to other people that you just can't get away with in real life? Oh, God, absolutely. <laughs> what he does with the Google Hubs. I don't really think you can do that, but I thought it'd be fun if you did. And if if you couldn't, it's a minor, minor point. Yeah, it, it's definitely creative license, but yeah, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments or questions from anybody? Okie dokie. It's um, a Wednesday night. It, yeah. Well, There's my brain. My, my brain is trying to prepare for the month to come. So. Um, so tell us a little bit about the project you're working on now. Okay. Uh, with this particular book, this started off with me just trying to explore who Christian is now and who he was because he, you kind of hit on something, Diane, he is a little bit of a mysterious character. Mm -hmm. You don't really know much about him. He didn't really have to. He served a purpose in that book. And I thought, well, if he does have a past, to me, he was this sort of quiet, very respectful, very articulate individual. I'm like, I can work with that. And I started to wonder, what is his past? And I came up with it very quickly. And I kept thinking, well, one of the other things Kathy Brockman had mentioned too was she wanted to know a little bit more about uh, the photographer, uh, mm -hmm. Milton Glass. Yeah, like, yeah. He well, was a yeah, really curious character. At the end of the book, I mean, he's passed. So right. really, what could I do with him? Except I did find a way to bring him into the story. And this one has taken a lot of research because it's it starts off here. And it does eventually move to Vietnam, where I've never been. So I've actually, I've got friends in Vietnam um, on Facebook, and I've been able to message them and say, can you tell me about this? And what about this custom? And if uh, there was Ho Chi Minh City, which is one of the big cities in Vietnam, they call it, they still call it Saigon versus Ho Chi Minh City. Because that was one of my questions. Okay. I keep referring to it, or it was one of them together. I'm like, is it this or is it this? Because it's essentially the same city. So they were able to say, no, it's this. You know, and this would be so the one, custom. So one was pre-war name and the other was post-war? Is that how that what? works? Sure. Okay. I mean, Let's go with that. It's just, it's, <laughs> for, for foreigners, they kind of go with one thing, and for everyone else, it's it's considered this. I didn't know that there were three major dialects like did like we've got like the southern folks here in the u.s you got like maybe boston here and you got yeah Michigan. they've got a southern central and northern accent up there and i'm like oh god i didn't know that so i was able to kind of play with that and the character uh, christian who happens to speak vietnamese uh who had uh, uh, a roommate in college for four years who taught him and that's how he learned he has a very southern accent and as he gets further north, everyone keeps commenting. It got to be a little bit of a running joke where every time he starts to speak Vietnamese, everyone remarks his southern accent. Yeah. Okay. So I was able to kind of get that into it. So a lot of more research went into this book. Uh, it's this one is a bit of a bit of a mystery at times as to why he's there. And if you want, if anyone's interested, I can read you what is passing as the proposed back cover of the book right now. Ooh, ooh, we have a synopsis. How close synopsis. are we? How close are we to publication? I am looking at June. 
Ah, perfect. Birthday uh, present. I'm pretty sure once I get the first draft done, which I'm hoping to have the first draft done in the next couple of days, then I can start going through doing my edit, get it off to my three three editors. And I think it'll go very quickly from that point because I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to need to change throughout the story. But uh, this is how the back cover right now is currently reading. Okay. I have one more job for you. Famous World War II photographer Milton Glass's passing leaves an unfinished task for personal assistant Christian Orr. Discover the fate of a soldier's child who had been born and abandoned during the Vietnam War. Christian hesitates to get involved until an even greater mystery presents itself in the form of a name uttered 30 years earlier by a comatose man on the other side of the world. A name no one there could possibly know. In an unfamiliar country and completely out of his element, Christian must uncover the life of a man born of two cultures, accepted by neither, and his connection to the whispered name. The answers draw Christian into a personal journey, unlike anything he's experienced before, towards a fate two lifetimes in the making. Okay, yeah, I, I want to read that. I definitely want to read that. One of the pieces of research that I had come up with, and it came up randomly during the writing of Butterflies, this phrase kept coming up called um, children of the dust. Mike, was right. that like a Stephen King offshoot to children of the corn? What, what is this? Yeah. It turns out that tens of thousands of American GIs during the Vietnam War fathered children in Vietnam with Vietnamese women. Then the men were recalled or they left or they abandoned the families there and went home. And some of the children made it to the U.S. Some did not. But the ones who were born, they didn't look Vietnamese. They looked like a mix. And the Vietnamese people at the time, because of the American GIs and what they were reminded of with them, these people were not – they didn't get schooling. They couldn't get jobs. They were beaten. They were kicked. They were spit on. Uh, they were not taken care of. They were put in orphanages, and the, so the mothers just didn't want them. completely dehumanized. And it wasn't just in Vietnam, even the U.S. The U.S. didn't want them either. Okay. So there was this whole thing. I'm like, And so I kept reading about this, and I'm like, I've got to use this at some point. So that actually figures into the entire book, the whole story of when he mentions a man you know, born of two cultures on the other side of the world. We're talking about somebody who was an American GI son, who the gist of the story is that Milton Glass was uh, approached by a, a Vietnam veteran who had left and he had fallen in love and he had found out that he had fathered a child, but because he had somebody waiting back at home, he came back and he never contacted them. Well, 24 years later, 23 years later, he had received one additional letter from his for the woman he had had the child with, and she said that their son had been beaten. She did not know if he was ever going to wake up. Would he come over? And he never he never responded to it. So in present day, that man had contacted Milton Glass and said, this is unresolved. My wife just passed. I've been diagnosed with terminal cancer. I want to know if my son lived or died. So Christian, having Milton had just passed, has gone back to L.A., and Milton has left a box of items for him with a little uh, memory stick with a little video thing on there from himself to Christian stating, I have a job for you. And there's a mystery in this that you will see once once you see it, you'll know why I'm asking you to go. So he asks him to do one more job by going to Vietnam to find out if this son lived or died. And then the other greater mystery that builds on that while he's there. That's okay. Is, is that going to be done in time for my birthday? I'm going to try. <laughs> okay. I usually, usually get a book published in, in June, so I am really going to try. Okay. I, I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to continue to harass you until you get it done. Bad now, and her duck birthday that. cake. It'll be Pardon the me? best birthday ever. Bad and yes. her duck birthday cake, and it'll be the best birthday ever. Yeah, yeah. a duck birthday cake, or, or you know, I'll take the dragon, too. Either one. <laughs> it's fine. Both you should have a dragon good. and a duck fighting each other on the cake. 
gosh, who would win that? You, because you'd eat it. Oh, okay, that works. Um, so I I have a question for for Ralph because we all sure. know that um, as as authors go, we all know that living with us is not always the easiest of paths to choose. So I'm curious about um, what Christopher's process looks like from the outside as his partner, when you watch him write, when you, um, does he bring you pieces to read? Does he bounce ideas off of you? Does, does he escape into a little piece of the basement and you don't see him for weeks? How, how does that writing work in, in your household? There are pieces that he brings up sometimes, but for the most part, we found out a long time ago that he needs to be on his own for writing. We tried sharing an office one time, and I still remember my great idea of, oh, this would be great. We'll work together in the office. I could do my thing. He'll do his. But every time I would play a bit of music or a video or do something or talk to him, he would get this crease on his forehead. So <laughs> I think we quickly learned that he, he works better alone. Uh, uh -huh. He does bring up little ideas every now and then. Says, "Hey, what about this?" Um, but but some of the research, like is was brand new. Like I didn't know about the the Vietnamese dust children. I think that's what was called. That's sad. Uh, I'm glad you didn't tell me. That's that's like Debbie yeah. Downer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Christopher, what was your biggest challenge in writing butterflies? What was the part that you stumbled the most over when you were writing it? With that one, I don't think, I think it went very smooth. That was the one book that went really smooth for me because it was like writing, like I said, writing a screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, I think it was, there was, okay, there, there was one tough part and that was the balance of Matthew's brother. His brother, I wanted to... <laughs> Kind of have this brother. It, it's it's a lower, maybe um, not low income family. They're 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 lower middle class family. Okay. And you never got to meet the sister, but you've got Matthew, who's the oldest, and then his younger brother, mm -hmm. and the younger brother who basically is the type who is going to watch Fox News, who's going to vote what everyone what everyone hates or he thinks they dislike. He's going to be that one person to go and do it. So when he sits down to have a family dinner, the stuff that spews out of his mouth, the amount of hatred and everything else, it was a lot worse in the first draft. And then okay. I started to ease back a little bit because people had such a reaction to him and that they, they couldn't get past it. And they still have a little bit of a hard time getting past him now, but it's not nearly as bad. And I had to give him an opportunity at the end not to completely come around, but to want to start to come around so that you can see it could happen. It may not, yeah. but it could. Yeah. That was the hard part right there. Giving him the potential to move from being the voice of dissension to maybe seeing it from a different perspective. I, I thought you handled that really well because that's a complex, as you say, that's a complex thing to manage over the course of a story like that. To me, it was like trying to have a conversation with a certain political following right now, mm -hmm. the followers of a certain political party who say, well, this, this, and this, and this, and they don't care who they've offended. Sure. That's yeah. just how they feel. And that's what you're going to have to deal with. And that is exactly what I viewed in him, except he was family in this case. Right. I love the way you gave Matthew internal dialogue. I think I gave him both internal dialogue. But I love what you did with Matthew's internal dialogue because everybody else recognized he was talking to himself and not saying it out loud. I love that phrase, use your words. That so everybody, everybody sees the wheels turning and they have to say, you have to speak that right where did you get the idea to interject that because usually internal dialogue written in novels is very private to the character nobody else knows it's going on 
Where did you get the idea to allow people around him to recognize he was doing it? Where, again, it was balanced. Gian doesn't have a quiet thought in his body. Mm -hmm. Matthew had to be the exact opposite. But, and he would have been this way all his life. So his parents would have had to have dragged it out of him, which his siblings would have then dragged it out of him, which then his friends or his teachers would have had to drag it out of him. So it just became a thing. And Gian quickly picked up on it too. After Matthew said, they usually tell me to use my words. So Gian, use your words, Matthew. Okay. Yeah. I just, I thought that was also a really cool character device because in the majority of work that I read, that internal voice is very private. It's very specific to the character's own thoughts. So I thought it was neat that you allowed us to kind of see inside his brain a little bit more. There were certain bits of dialogue between the two of them that to this day, I will read and I will laugh mm. until it hurts. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing when you can read your own writing and go, damn, that worked. That that was <laughs> yeah. funny. I, I think but, it's an awesome thing to, because then you realize that your readers are getting it. Because there was, there was a phrase that Gian didn't get to finish, and I purposely did that, where it was um, at the DIA when they have met up with Milton, mm -hmm. and he says, well, you know, you are, and he's like, oh, Dr. Matthew Richter, and they looked at Gian, he's like, and you? And Gian feels caught in the spotlight, so he just completely fakes, he says, oh, Dr. Gian Wei, and then he's like, you're not a doctor. <laughs> and he says something about, uh, well, you can borrow my title if you like, it's big enough for the two of us. And Gian looks at him and says, you can suck my left. And then it's as far as he gets because he gets cut <laughs> off. I loved that moment. I don't know what it was about that moment, but I I laughed. And I still laugh when I get when I get to that part because to me, it's just funny as hell. I, I thought that moment was really fun too. Um, the thing I loved also about this story is that you allowed us to be for lack of a better term, emotional voyeurs with these characters. Which I think is a, a real challenging thing to do. And you tend to do this in all of your work. It's part of why I love what you write so much, because you have the ability to really allow us to experience the same emotions that your uh, characters are going through. But we do it with a, it's almost with a, a, a veil of, of gauze between us and the characters. So we're watching it, being a part of it, but not completely connected. And I love that distance that you create. I think it creates a lot of anticipation in your writing. Thank you. And I hope that's gonna go into the new book too, because with Christian coming out of Butterflies, um, he does mention characters from Butterflies in this book. And this is something the first time I've ever done this too. In um, Snow Angels, what I've done, there are two characters I introduce about a third of the way in, about a third or half of the way in. And I've never done this before, but I thought, part of world building, these two characters are from Falling Awake 3. Ooh. I've Ooh. ported them over from Falling Awake 3 into this story one is never mentioned by name in falling awake three he's got two maybe a paragraph or two where he simply shows up in a scene without a name and that scene he's in is shown in a flashback in this book so that you know who that character was if you happen to have read it the other character is mentioned by name in this one and basically introduced in the same way that he is introduced in falling awake three and oh, serving a very similar purpose. The first time I've ever done that, I'm I'm still puzzled. I'm like, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? But I'm <laughs> I'm almost thinking, I want Kathy Brockman to read this new book and go, <laughs> I'm very curious about these characters. What about them? Oh, lady, this book's already written. You can go buy this <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, that that's a great way to create um, adjunct sales, right? <laughs> I mean, not doing it purposefully, but it does work that way. And it, it happened to work for these two characters because in order for Christian to get from point A to point B, he needs their help to get there. So they, they're not just dropped in. They serve a purpose for the whole story. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. And you get to you get to learn a little bit more about these other characters that you didn't get to learn about so much in the third book. I am so excited for this book to come out. So if excited. it works, if it works. So keeping my fingers crossed it'll work. I, I I can't so now that you say that and you're emphasizing that, I'm super curious about how much you write doesn't make it to the page. At this point, very little. It'll get edited. It will get revised. But there's, I can't think of anything that really gets cut. The exception being with Butterflies, the epilogue in that book, mm -hmm. where the father comes and he reads the poem, right. was originally the last chapter, and there was a different epilogue. But when it got to the editing of it, I was not confident in that epilogue. And when I went through the three editors... We all agreed it's got to be axed. And essentially what that epilogue originally was, uh, it would have taken place 12, 13 years after the last chapter of Butterflies, where this mother and her uh, husband are having a conversation. They're moving around the living room talking about their their newborns. Well, the kid, the kid's going to be turning two years old and where they were going to get his cake from. And they mentioned getting the cake from the Asian market, which is nearby, which would be where Jean worked. And as they're going back and forth, the one sets their iPhone down and the iPhone falls into the crib with the two-year-old. And as they're talking, all of a sudden they hear this snapping of the camera and they look and their two-year-old is taking their picture. Insinuating that Milton Glass has been born again and come uh, back. Yeah. Which it was a cute idea, but as everyone and we all agreed, he wouldn't have come back. There was no reason for him to come back. It it, it was done. It was over with. It, it just it it didn't need. Yeah, to be it's it's kind of pushing pushing that extra ledge that you don't need to push, right? Right. That and that's yeah. why I thought, okay, the last chapter will now become the epilogue where the father reads the poem, and I loved, I loved that poem. I loved writing it because then I could pick certain phrases out of that that those characters would repeat in their dialogue from beginning to end. And when you finally got to that, it was the epiphany of, oh, my God. So so the poem came before the dialogue? The poem was written right after the first chapter was written. I knew wow. what I wanted to call it. I knew what the book would be called, like, from the first chapter on. I knew exactly what the book was going to be called. And then I thought, well, it's got to be, it's got to come from somewhere. So then I wrote the poem so that I had the poem to refer back to. And I so, thought, well, so what was that writing poetry challenge like? Was that a challenge for you? Do you write poetry just for fun in addition to the prose you write? What was that something that because it, it really is a, a linchpin in this story? It may did be the only plan it I've that ever... way or did it just come out that way? It was meant to be a linchpin, um, but it's also the only poem I think I've ever written that worked. I, I suck at writing poetry. I tried. I tried in college. It's I've hard. I've never gotten the knack for it, ever, never. But I needed to have something. So I thought, okay, there'll be the two soldiers. One soldier will write the first two stanzas. The second soldier will write the next two. And the two characters in modern day will have things that they recite in their daily, you know, their little, you know, quirky sayings will come from this poem that will only be revealed at the very end. And the way they meet when Gian has his own little phrase of, and here we meet, my shoulder to yours. Mm -hmm. There's never been an answer to it until Matthew looks at him and says, you know, um, discovering something never expected, my soul to yours is the correct answer. And he gets it. And right. you don't know why until that very last page. When you read it, the poem, and you see the one stanza ends and the other one begins with those two lines. Yes. Then it comes together. And and that was the thing that I just love so much about it is because that payoff was really strong. Like I say, it it had a I just feel so satisfied with this ending. I just I think it's it's it was so well crafted. And the father got it. That's yes. what I like too, is he understood, he knew exactly what it was because he was the one who said to his son several times oh you're going to go to this you know what like butterflies you have known son yeah like butterflies i've known 
to finally get that to the very end and never have known since his son was old enough to talk where that phrase come, came from to get to the very end of the book and find out that's where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I love the connection that it's, it's kind of like, I hate to say this phrase cause it's so Oprah, but it was a full circle moment for me. It's just like, it just connected all the pieces. It's and it was meant cool. to be, it, it was meant to be full circle at that point. It was very cool. Does anybody else have any questions or comments for Christopher? Before Ralph falls back asleep, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm Ralph. Sorry, I know we got you up super early this morning. No, anybody okay. else? Anybody else? Let me throw something out there just yes. in case. If not, yes. no big yes. deal, no harm, no foul. Yes, sir. But on the, uh, <laughs> Ralph will fall asleep on this one, but uh, just in case anyone was interested, um, I did do a bit of editing and I do have a short prologue for uh, the new book that I could read. Oh my gosh. Yes. I would love if, to hear that. If anyone is, it's, it's not very long at all. It's short. So but... I'm the obsessed fan. What do you guys think? Do you guys want to hear this little piece? Yes. Okay. okay. Go Christopher. Ralph, if you, if you nod off, it's okay. My voice usually puts him to sleep. <laughs> it's this sad, is where, but it's true. This is where we'll engage selective hearing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, like I said, it is short, but um, let's see here. Cleveland, Tennessee, rarely saw an abundance of snow coat its trees, churches, schools, homes, stores, and roads each December. But this year... Maybe Santa had heard Christian's prayers, or maybe he wasn't the only six-year-old who'd wished and dreamed for a white Christmas. Maybe Santa would even visit this holiday. Christian hoped so. He'd been trying his hardest to stay off the naughty list, only his father kept telling him he wasn't working hard enough. Snow fell all around him, and he had covered the grass. Ah, let me try that again. Snow fell all around him and had covered the grass with almost a foot already with no signs of letting up. Christian stared up into the sky, then had to shut his eyes most of the way to stop the flakes from getting in. He grinned, opened his mouth, and stuck his tongue out. Sweet coldness rewarded his efforts, and he breathed the cool air in deeply, then exhaled and watched his breath. Christian surveyed the area and made a decision right there on the spot. He knew exactly what they'd do. Let's make angels, Lucas. Oops. Lucas, he corrected himself. Too many words with an S. Good thing Dad didn't hear him. Christian slowed the words down in his head before they came out of his mouth. What were the things the doctor, the speech doctor, demanded he do? Enunciate and articulate. Whatever those words meant. We'll make snow angels. He stood straight up, fell backwards into the snow, and started waving his arms and legs, giggling like he did when someone at school told a funny joke. The cold didn't bother him. The snow landing on him didn't chill him. The dark night and years ahead of him didn't scare him, at least not yet. Christian sat up, careful not to disturb the design of the snow he so painstakingly created, stood, and took a giant step outside of the shape. Take my hand, Lucas. We'll turn around and look at them together. He reached out and, satisfied he held Lucas's hand, whirled around. Only one angel indented the snow, but that didn't matter. Christian knew there were two. The second one was in his mind and just as perfect as the one visible before him. Maybe even more perfect. Lucas loved doing things like this. They did them together. Well, they did in Christian's mind, and they would do them together one day for real. The snow that landed in Christian's hair finally reached his scalp, warmed, and began to melt, creating several drops that connected with other melting flakes and dripped down his forehead, past his eyes, past his smile, and onto the material of his G.I. Joe sweatshirt. Dad would be looking for him soon. Bath time. Speaking exercises, then bed. No TV. No holiday specials. No Christmas list. Just work. Hard work. And if he was lucky and Dad saw him practicing enough, maybe that visit from Santa in two weeks. Maybe. The one thing Mom and Dad couldn't take from him this evening was the angel he'd just made. He'd stare at it from his bedroom window, long after they turned his light off, and until the falling snow covered it. Maybe he'd sneak out and make another tomorrow. A boy could dream. Christian did, and he also dreamed of Lucas. Did Lucas dream of him? Lucas, do you? 
ringing. He heard ringing. Where is it coming from? Wait, where am I? The world around him exploded in color, sound, and shapes. Yanked, Christian felt himself wrenched forward, forward to another place far away from the snow, far from the snow angels, far from home, far from Lucas. His mind screamed to go back, to return where he'd just been. No. The cell phone rang and woke Christian. Such a strange dream, too, making the interruption a welcome one because of that. He'd lived that moment in his parents' home 25 years earlier, making a snow angel on a snowy night before everything else went wrong in life, and long before he started working for a world-famous photographer. There'd been other details in his dream about the past, only the more he tried to recall them, the quicker they slipped away. He glanced at the caller's ID. No name listed, just a number, a California area code. Hello? May I speak to Christian Orr? This is Christian. He listened to several seconds of silence, then took a deep breath. Something happened. There could be no other explanation. My name is Sergeant Wilmoth. Your name is listed as an emergency contact from Milton Glass. Yes, Christian could barely breathe. So okay. that, moment, that so, moment was actually in Butterflies, where he has picked up the phone at the very end and finds out that Milton Glass has passed. Yes, yes, yes. And and that was part of why I really, really was interested in whether or not you were going to write a sequel, because I remembered that scene so vividly. So I'm very excited. And now you have to have this done before June 14th, or else I'm going to come knock on your door and make you print out a version from your computer so that I can read it. Well, I'm so, sure Cuckoo will let you in the door. So you've been warned. The dog will <laughs> let you in. Okay. Perfect. Anybody have any other questions for Christopher? Marianne, or Ralph. Catherine? Yeah, or Ralph. We can ask Ralph questions too. Ralph, is it is it summertime or is it wintertime in China? Uh, in Hong Kong it's it's a uh it's winter time right now okay so you're not like australia and you're not like upside down over there no okay. we're yeah we're seasons match okay cool anybody else have questions i have a question it's just how did you choose the name milton glass um what my uh, mentor uh at school was named milton ford and I, I really loved the name Milton. And when I was looking for popular names during men's names during World War II time at that age that the character would have been, Milton showed up. And whereas I called him Milt, I liked I always liked Milton. I thought that was kind of neat. So I ended up just choosing that as the first name. Glass, I was looking up, again, last names that were popular at the time. And the two just kind of went together. There were probably other character names, so that's the reason I asked. <laughs> Say that again, Dan. Are really weird. I I struggle, like I just did the short story that Diana knows about, and I really struggled with names because I'm like, do I want a name that I I'm a teacher, so I'm like, I have to be careful. Is it a name that you know is the character going to be somebody like, hey, is that based off my son? So I always try to be careful with names, but I like the Milton Glass. I'm like, I wonder if it was somebody you knew and you switched the name around. So character character names are hard for me. I'll tell you what, my work right now, I work in a hospital, and uh, if I ever needed to, I can bring up a patient list for the day, and I can scroll through a thousand names. <laughs> and that's that's really fun. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not nearly that um, accessible to it. There's a great website called BehindTheName.com, and that's what I use. I tend to look up the meanings before I find the names to fit the meanings I want to use. So it's kind of like a reverse search. Whereas I know a lot of authors who use baby names. Um, I'm stunned over and over again about how much difficulty writers have in naming their characters. This seems to be a universal issue we have. It's crazy. We put so much effort into finding just the right name. It's kind of weird. I'm struggling right now because some of the characters in the book have Vietnamese names. I can't pronounce them. They look really good. <laughs> like I have to, you have more than three or four of them you're like no I've got two people with the, with the name that begins with the letter T which is very common over there so I need something else but it can't look like an English word that you would mistake and 
you want to think with something else. So yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah. Well, and I don't I don't know if this is a real thing. Maybe it's just my perception, but Ralph, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't Asian names traditionally the surname comes first? The family name comes first and then the first name comes second? Right. So uh, when you're pronouncing the full, it'd be like the last name. So uh, like for my grandma, it's Chen Wai Fong, which is Chan. And you put it first and then you say the, the rest of their name. Okay. Yeah. So you like name the family first. Correct. Because that, that was important in olden times is the family you came from. So that was the. Yeah. The yeah. They do the same thing in Hebrew, except the word of that we would say you're from this family it's it's the person's name of the family name so that's how they pronounce their full you know first and surnames it it, it was weird when i put my son's name on the baby naming certificate in hebrew it was it, it was his name ben which is of my name it was very strange Okay, any other questions? Charlie wants to do the spinning wheel of happiness, don't you? Um, any other questions from you guys for Christopher? Uh, I have a question. Um, so in a, almost everything you write, Christopher, there is um, reference to music. Mm. So the music that you reference um, in this book, um, did you have a specific reason for that? Yes, yes. Um, now, funny thing is, when you mentioned that, uh, one of my best friends who had passed away, his um, his father is a huge reader, and his father, his parents and I still talk, and his, his father reads the books, and he always emails me afterwards. And he's like, I looked up the songs that you mentioned. The songs are always very, very specific, and they're there for a reason, especially in Beautiful Moment. Uh, they were there for a reason. And, and Butterflies... Uh, I think the very first one that's mentioned, um, I had gone to a concert, I think it was last year, and it was uh, Tears for Fears, one of my favorite 80s bands, and the opening group was Garbage. And I knew one or two songs by Garbage. I really wa wasn't overly thrilled, didn't really care to see them, whatnot. They came on stage, and their first song was called Automatic Systematic Habit. And from that song on, I was a fan that song was just absolutely amazing so in the book i thought well okay i can have them listen to that one because it's very upbeat but i think the first song that's mentioned in in butterflies was the kylie minogue song um say something which ralph is a huge kylie fan so i would listen to kylie when he did and i would listen to when she would come out with a new album and that song i just i thought that is a song that if i was getting out of bed like gian does I would just be dancing around the room, going to the bathroom, just like Gian does, exactly <laughs> like that. And then afterwards in the shower, they come out of it, and Matthew wants garbage, automatic, systematic habit. So I, if something really, really catches my eye, I will put that song into each, – each book has its own soundtrack. Right. Each, right. each book, as I'm writing it, I will play very specific songs for specific scenes, and a lot of times those songs will get mentioned at some point in the book because they are my absolute favorites in um beautiful moment there was one called uh, on the beam by space monkey it's an actual song it was an actual group back, back in the 80s they did one album and i love that song so i thought there's got to be a way to slip it in and then so ralph was one who listened to spice girls so i brought spice girls into it for uh the the, the surgeon uh, the doctor from that book he would listen to spice girls wannabe so does your playlist inform the book or does the book grab from the playlist when both. you're writing both back and forth there are times that i'll hear a song i'm like oh my god that would work perfect for this sequence okay or i just uh, there's a like a, there's a new song on there i'm like oh you know this is this would be really good to listen to and i'll put that on there and pretty soon i'm like yeah hey, you know what that would really go well in this particular scene if i was going to do a film that I would do this and I would use that song in it. Music plays a huge, huge part when I'm writing a book. Huge. Cool. Wow. Okay. Anybody else? 
Any other questions? No? No? Really? We got to everything? Okay. There's only six of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, five and, and a half. Marianne's wasted. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say, Marianne's only kind of here. And... Marianne, how many fingers am I holding up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, Christopher, tell everybody, what could they win on the spinning wheel of happiness? Well, what I thought I would do is this. Um, if whoever wins, with the exception of Ralph, clearly, uh, <laughs> would like an older, anyone, any one of my older books, happy to send that. Or when uh, the new one comes out, I will send you a copy of the new one upon publication. Oh, decisions, decisions. So okay. it'll be up to you, however you want to do it. So it's it's listener's choice. Yep. Charlie's very excited about this spinning. And I am looking at June for uh, Snow Angels in the Dust. Yeah, and you're going to be talking about that during festival too. So I'm I'm super excited about that. That's going to hopefully be I'll have the first draft done by then. <laughs> so, so that last chapter is getting me. I'm going to share the spinning wheel screen. Can everybody see that? There it is. See, Charlie's cheering us on. So there's the spinning wheel. We only have three people's names on it because Ralph is, you know, married to the author. So I'm assuming, Ralph, you have all of his books on your shelf already. Oh, Probably. yes. Yeah, that's what I figured. Okay, right. so um, we're going to spin the wheel and then you get to tell Christopher what you want to win. Wouldn't you just love it if, if like, Price is Right worked that way? You get to tell Bob Barker what you want to win. Okay, here we go. We're going to spin the wheel. I don't have sound on it tonight, guys. Sorry. Here we go. Oh. And the peasants rejoice. Donna, <laughs> what would you like to win? Can I possibly get the book previous one? Which uh, previous one? Beautiful Moment. Yeah, the one you've been talking about that I don't haven't read that one. Is that the one you're that you've been it. talking about tonight? Yes. <laughs> okay. I couldn't think of the name of it. <laughs> yes, I would love to have you know, a moment. Perfect. Okay, so Donna, this is what you have to do. Send me an email with your mailing address in it. I will make sure Christopher gets that. He will personally inscribe a copy of Beautiful Moment for you and get that out into the mail. Quick and, question. Yes, sir. Katie, what would you have chosen? Um, good question. But what I would have asked you is um for you to make a choice and because I would like to give it to my daughter. So it would have been your personal choice. Um you know, that's I, a I'd really like really to get my, yeah, that's, I, that's I wonder, a great question. Which one of your books is your favorite, Christopher? Right. How how old is your daughter? She's eighteen. She just started university, and okay. I know most of your writing would really resonate with her. So that's what I would have asked you: is your choice, if you were to pick one for an eighteen, nineteen year old. Send your address to Diana. I'll send one out. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. I just, I, cause she asked me, I just dropped her off at school today for a second semester. And she asked me what I was doing tonight. Cause I said, oh, I got to get home. I, I have a meeting. And she goes, for what? And I said, for book club. And so I had a little discussion with her about, your books um and she's like oh that sounds like something i'd be really interested in i could send her a copy of butterflies because i think if it's gonna the other ones are a little dark really dark yeah butterflies is the lighter of them so if you like when you send diana your address send me her name i'll personalize it send it over to you okay that would be great um just because I enjoy everything that you read. Um, and she's my reader in the family. Um, and I really, I really think what you write 
is something that would resonate with her. I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Where does she go to school at? Um, she goes to the University of Massachusetts. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and she's a, uh, she's very um. She's interested in a lot of things. Um, she um. What is she going is, to study? Well, here's the thing. She they have a program there where you can create your own major. So that's what <laughs> what she's working towards. In her first year, she's got to take a couple of writing seminars because she has to write a proposal. Um, for what she what major she wants to create. That'll be fun. Yeah. So oh. very cool. Very, yeah. very cool. So Christopher, what's your favorite book that you've written? <laughs> you know, I anticipated you were gonna ask me that question today. <laughs> Honestly, I go back to anything from like falling awake to forward, and I will go through a bunch of them. I almost want to say I go back to Falling Awake 4 um, a lot, only because it was so vastly different. It was a very noir, detective, modern-day Western. And I had a lot of fun writing it because it dealt with law enforcement. It dealt with law enforcement characters. And I grew up, my father was a police officer. So okay. I grew up okay. with police officers all my life, surrounded by them. And I loved being able to get into that type of a story, but it was set in like the early 70s, early to mid 70s, and do something with those characters, almost making it a Western, um, and just really get into their personalities of the type of people they were. That that was the one I think I stretched the most. Okay. And for some reason, I keep going back to that just because of the characters. Very cool. Very cool. So that means there's four books. <laughs> they have three books people have to read before they get to your favorite. <laughs> well, things, if they're going to read. That, um, again, is a good way to set up book sales. <laughs> if they're going to read Snow Angels, they don't have to read Falling Awake 3. But if they want to have an idea help. of some of the characters, it would be it couldn't hurt. But they don't have yeah. to. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, anybody else have questions before we let uh, Ralph go back to bed? And me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Christopher has to get up early in the morning, too. Any other questions or comments for Christopher? Okay, my address is diana at pagespromotions.com if anybody needs to reach me or wants to learn more about the book festival that is coming up throughout the entire month of February. It's going to be goofy fun. Um, Donna, Christopher, and Marianne are all playing cast members for our murder mystery insanity that we're going to be doing. It's going to be super fun. Um, come on out. Check us out. It's free. It's on Zoom every night from 7 to 8. Um, it's going to be a blast. All the details are on the website. In March, the book club is going to be reading... Um, where is it? I know I have it here. Here it is. The Future... Belongs to Those Who Believe by Amy Kelso. This is a collection of short stories. Um, so that's what we're reading for March. So if you want to check into that, start reading that now. You have an extra month because we're not doing book club for February because we're doing insanity for February. Um, and then uh, the last day in March, we'll be meeting with Amy Kelso and we'll get to put her in the hot seat and talk about her work as well. I'm what was really the name of the book again? It's called The Future Belongs to Those Who Believe. Thank you. And it's a collection of short stories. Um, really great stuff. Check it out. It's awesome. Um, so thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. I'm really grateful that you're uh, starting out this new experimental book club with me. And uh, we're going to have more indie authors as the year goes on. And if we get a lot of interest, we'll do it twice a month. So check it out. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Have an awesome evening and festival begins tomorrow. Thank you for all the I questions. I will be on time tonight. tomorrow. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I want to see Marianne hold her head up tomorrow. 
<laughs> Thank you, everybody. Tomorrow. <laughs> Diana, it was nice to meet you. Marianne, Catherine, Donna, thanks for letting me join. Always, <laughs> Ralph, you're always welcome. <laughs>